I'm going to speak for um, about 15 minutes about X plus one, which is the company that I run today. Um, and part of that is a, a video that I'm going to play. And then I'm going to spend about 15 minutes talking about pivots, which is, is what Peter asked, asked me to talk about. And then it's all, it's all Q&A. And, and Peter, I, I appreciate the, the no questions. But honestly, if there's a question that you want to ask as I'm getting into this or clarification, please, it's OK. It won't throw me at all, OK? So um, let's see if I can get to the very few PowerPoint slides that I have here. So uh, X plus one is a uh, technology company. Um, and it's, it, we're, we're square in the middle of what I think is the hottest area in, in uh, marketing today, which is ad tech or advertising technology. Um, and uh, what we say is X plus one enables more relevant digital communications. Uh, to help the world's best companies grow. And that's really about grabbing data from digital interactions on mobile phones, on your computer, in email, any place that there's an IP connection, um, we can grab the data in real time and make a decision about what content or offer or marketing communication to put in front of the consumer um, that's informed by that information and all of the other information that the platform has collected about the user. You know, some, some people, you know, may think that's a little bit creepy, um, but it's all anonymous. We never know who the actual person is, and it's very inferential in terms of how it works. Um, and what we talk about is using our technology to help marketers create a digital marketing hub. And that's, that's this little visual here where your email, your call center, your search efforts, your website, your mobile are all connected um, to this hub that's created by our technology. And that's all in the interest, of course, of acquiring uh, and ident identifying and acquiring new customers, helping uh, grow business from clients' existing customers, or increase the efficiency and the effectiveness of your brand marketing. And we do this for uh, some, some big clients like Verizon and Citibank and Capital One and Electronic Arts um, who use the platform. So questions? Yeah. Okay. But I hate to start the discussion about the technology, because uh, that's really what, what drives us is this, this kid right here. Um, and that, that's, for me, literally, that's my son Jake. Um, he's 17. <laughs> um, but this is pretty much how I find him every night when I come home from work. Um, and if any of you guys have teenagers, I know you'll, you'll identify with this, because I have to go find him because he doesn't hear me when I come home from work because the headphones have Pandora in his ears. So Pandora's in his ears, he's texting on his iPhone, he's supposed to be doing his homework, and he's got the Yankee game on the television all at the same time. And what's amazing is his ability to manage and process those four different signals all at the same time. And what you realize when you start to, to study the cognitive processing that's going on here is that human beings have a phenomenal capability to filter out information or signal that is not relevant to them. And we've all had the experience, right, of that you never, never noticed something, but then for some reason it's brought to your attention and you realize, oh my God, I, it's all, all over the place. Because it wasn't relevant to you, your brain doesn't even recognize it. Well, that's good news for young Jake here that he can filter out all of, this, all of the noise to focus on just the signals he, he cares about. But that's terrible news for marketers who are trying to reach him. Because what he's filtering out is advertising and marketing messages. Now, luckily there's an antidote to that. And that's relevance. Despite all that filtering that's going on in order to manage four different sensory inputs and signals, if something is really relevant to Jake, if it's something he cares about, my, my son's into rugby in a big way. If there's anything that has to do with rugby that goes across any of those screens, you can bet he's going to notice it, right? So that's really the challenge and the opportunity that marketers have today is they've got to reach that consumer and they have the opportunity today to use data in real time to create relevant communications that can cut through that sensory block to penetrate that consumer's mind. And that's what we're helping marketers do. There, there are a number of components of the platform here that are being used that are all keyed off of 
what's listed here is a DMP or data management platform and a decisioning engine. So the data management platform is what allows the, the every interaction to be logged and data to be pulled together uh, and data to be pulled together from a variety of third party sources. So Experian provides data, Axiom provides data, and then companies that are natively digital like Blue Kai and Exalate, where you can actually buy data tied to cookies. So you don't know who the person is, but you know what their college education is and whether they're in the market for an automotive of a particular maker model at any given time. There's a tremendous amount of data available for purchase, and all that data is logged into the platform, as well as the behaviors of the individual users and cookies, and then that's matched in this case to his frequent flyer number and all the data in the, in the client's customer warehouse. So all of that data can be tumbled in literally in milliseconds in order to make a decision about what to, should be displayed to them in each channel. Um, of course, clients don't necessarily have to buy the whole package. They can buy specific modules, just the media piece, just the website optimization piece, and so forth. So there's a number of, of discrete um, modules that are available, and different clients buy different combinations of those capabilities. And then uh, the platform, we have a, a whole ecosystem of partnerships so that the platform can seamlessly connect out to other systems. So for the SMS messaging on the phone, we use Velti, which is a global mobile uh, provider of SMS services. For um, some other mobile things, for mobile advertising, we connect into WDA. Nanigans is a Facebook buying platform, so they would have bought the ads on Facebook and connected through our platform and so forth. So um, the connectivity in the internet is very important so that that decision of what to show can be pushed into these other systems and channels um, pretty seamlessly. And the system has to operate at massive scale. So in order for you as a consumer not to have a delay in that website loading or that ad being delivered, that data has to be pulled in, a decision made, and pushed back out in under 30 milliseconds. So <laughs> that's, that's really fast. <laughs> it's really fast. And the platform handles 300 billion ad requests a month, can process 220,000 transactions per second. There's 1.5 billion user profiles currently under management. <laughs> and those user profiles have scaled to over 6,000 attributes per user simultaneously. And we process about 120 terabytes of data every day. So there's a massive infrastructure um, behind all this. Um, really sort of the cutting edge of high volume computing um, in order to make this all happen. Um, I'm, I'm really blessed to have some unbelievably talented technical people who make this all happen. But X plus one didn't start out as this company. Um, I actually joined as CEO in, in 2008, but the company was founded in 1999. And when the company was originally founded, um, it was actually an ad server that competed with DoubleClick. Uh, do you guys, are you guys familiar with DoubleClick? It's owned by Google, probably delivers 70% of all the ads that you see on the internet. Um, and in 1999, um, the founders of, of X plus one, um, at the time it was called Poindexter Systems, um, had come up with a optimization engine that they thought made their ad server smarter than DoubleClick's ad server. And in fact, um, this optimization engine was invented by the CTO of Amazon at the time, who had gone to Harvard with the founders of X plus one. He was a personal friend, and, a, and a, as a personal favor, uh, on his off hours, developed this optimization platform. <laughs> True story. Um, but of course, um, this is 1999, and so you know the volumes of ads on the internet were nothing compared to what they are today. And then this company called Atlas emerged, which was another ad-serving company, later to be bought by Microsoft for $6 billion. Um, and there, became, there was a price war between DoubleClick and Atlas, and the CPMs, or cost per thousands, for delivering ads fell through the floor. And the founders um, at Poindexter quickly looked at their business plan and said, uh-oh, at those CPMs, we can't make the economics of this thing work. Okay, so here's my first pivot. 
right? Pivot, one foot's always on the ground in basketball when you pivot, right? So it's not a complete change in plans, it's just a little alteration of strategy. And so the, the founder said, well, what else can we do with this optimization engine, which they had applied for a patent for and was really the, the heart around which the company was built? And they thought, well, the value of optimizing an ad delivery is the incremental value, and that maybe isn't, isn't so much. But when somebody comes to a client's website, the optimization of the offer delivered on the website has a lot more value. Oh, and by the way, the volume of ads or, or the volume on a client's website is very small compared to having to deliver ads out on Yahoo. And so our infrastructure costs go way down if we focus on clients' websites rather than online advertising. And so that was the first pivot. And they turned X plus one from an ad server into an, a website optimization company. And uh, that really worked. They won a couple of really big clients based on that premise, um, American Express and America Online. And so how many people were using America Online in 2004 and 2005? Seven. <laughs> 2007? No. Oh. <laughs> well, if you were using it at that time, you will remember with no fondness whatsoever that AOL would pop up windows offering you all manner of products and cross-sells and phone service and all kinds of things. That was all Poindexter. Figuring out what offers to put in front of you on AOL. And it made a lot of money for AOL. Um, so much money, in fact, that AOL decided that they needed to have their own technology to do this. And in late 2006, they bought Dakota and then in, in short order bought a company called Ad.com. And both of those companies had optimization platforms. And so at, by this point, AOL was 60% of the revenue of Poindexter, um, and American Express was 20% of the revenue, um, and AOL literally went away as a client overnight. Gone. Don't need you anymore. So not, not a pivot yet. <laughs> but you can imagine as an entrepreneur, they, they, these guys were going, they, they went through one pivot, they repositioned the company, they, God, AOL was the biggest, baddest, you know, online property outside of Yahoo at that time. They're flying high. They just want American Express, and the AOL revenue stream goes away. Bam. CEO gets fired. Um, the uh, board puts a caretaker CEO in place. He gets ripped out a few months later. They put another caretaker CEO in place. By the time I show up in 2008, the company's got $9 million in debt. Um, they have, they're down to uh, about $5 million in revenue, but they still have 53 people. Um, so that's when John arrives and look around and go, this is a mess. What, do I, what am I going to do here? Um, but you always go back to what's the core IP of the company? What are they really good at? And for X plus one, it was going back to that optimization engine that was first coded by the CTO of Amazon in 2001. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm a quant geek, I love this stuff. And something struck me as really interesting. First, they were an ad server using this optimization engine, and that's about pushing ads out. And then it was a website optimization platform, and that's about people come to your website. Two different directions. Nothing else did that. Nothing, to this day, nothing else does that. It's bi-directional optimization. And so did, did a little work to understand how this engine worked and said, hmm, why shouldn't you manage your customer interactions on your website and in your advertising off of the same definition of the customer, the same data, the same algorithms? It just makes sense, right? So that's what I pitched to the board, is that we've got to turn this, take this asset that we have, this patent, and by, that, by 2007, the patent was actually awarded. Um, so it was a real patent now. We said, we're, we're going to turn this company, turn this technology into a digital marketing hub because I don't think there's anybody else out there that can do this, that can optimize bi-directional traffic. Well, so that sounded really good. The board bought off on it. We raised $18 million six months later, paid off the $9 million in debt. I had money to work with. We hired a new staff and set off on this new vision and began to build this new platform. And then Google bought DoubleClick. <laughs> 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 
And this thing called an ad exchange magically appeared. Um, DoubleClick had been working on it in the background, but it really hadn't gotten to any prominence. There was, uh, uh, the first ad exchange was called Right Media, uh, which is owned by Yahoo today, but it's kind of an also ran today. Um, but what Google did was take the idea of that ad exchange and say, we're gonna make it real time. And we, we were sort of sitting there and said, oh, well, you know, our, our platform for website optimization, it has to operate in real time because the consumer comes to the website, they've got to get an ad, you know, a page right now. And so we had a real time engine. I was, let's, let's see if we can use that real time engine to buy ads on Google. And so we sort of, another pivot. <laughs> and we bought the first RTB ad ever on Google. RTB real time bidding. The problem is by that time we had already built a website optimization business and we had won Delta Airlines and we had won, won a bunch of other clients. So now we had a website optimization business over here and we had this ad exchange business over here and the two of them really weren't connected to each other yet. Um, so we had to figure out how to put them together. And that was going along really well until Google bought Invite Media, one of our direct competitors. And all of a sudden, the revenue stream from this online buy RTB that we had developed, which was all through ad agencies, what do you think happened? Went away overnight. Because the ad agencies didn't need us anymore because Google bought one of our competitors and gave it to the ad agencies for free. So we had to go back to it again and pivot again. Say, okay, what are we gonna do now? Well, we said, well, let's go back to the original idea of a digital marketing hub that we got distracted by this RTB thing. So we pivoted again. And that's the strategy that we're still with today and have been really banging on and adding channels. So first was website and online ads, then we added mobile, we're adding email now, and one by one we're plugging additional channels into that digital marketing hub. And I'm, I'm really excited to say it's working really well, we're profitable, we're winning a lot of clients, we just raised uh, another, uh, we just raised $17 million in debt because we're profitable, we were able to access the debt markets, and we're expanding like crazy. But there were no less than five significant changes in strategy and adjustments in strategy along the way, but all built off of that same core technology before we got to something that really was gonna work and have some staying, or I think, have some staying power. So, I don't know if I'm, how I'm doing on time. I'm doing okay? So, so this is, you know, for, for any entrepreneurs who are working in the tech space today, the thing that I tell everybody now is the, the, the change cycle has gotten so short because of cloud computing. You can bring a new technology to market so fast because you don't have to buy infrastructure anymore. You literally, you call up Amazon, and you can host your code on Amazon. You don't have to lay out a lot of capital. You don't have to know, you don't have to deal with data centers. You don't have to, your ability to take an idea, encode it in software and get it into market can go from idea to execution so fast that new technologies are constantly disrupting the market in big ways and in small ways. And so if you are a technology startup, you have to be nimble. You can't fall in love with your idea. You have to be willing to pivot, change, and be constantly reacting to what's happening in the marketplace. And speed is probably your biggest competitive advantage. Um, I, I, I'm really excited for my next startup because I'm building it in the cloud. I don't want to deal with data centers and big hardware investments anymore. Um, because if you make a mistake, all you have to do is change the code, re-upload it, and you've made your pivot. Um, but if you're doing that, so is everybody else. Um, so it's a, really, it's a really different environment, I think, today for tech startups than it's ever been. Both exciting and more challenging in a lot of ways. That's great. Thanks, John. And now that I talked about it a, a few months ago, and, and um, that's why we wanted to have you here. I, and, I, and I, of course, speed in, in, in our era is, is really, really important. I think the other... Um, the other thing that, what I think is important, and I think you might have left out of your story, was uh, the amount of research that you probably did in each of those pivots. Because I, I know you, you brought on a whole bunch of advisors, you did some stuff with, a, with, with board people. 
Yeah. T take us through that just, just a little bit, because I, I think you really did bring some of your, your you know, consumer packaged goods training in to uh, make sure you were making the right choice as you were going there. Well, uh, you know, I, 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 it's probably not as scientific as, as that. Uh, we're, we're really blessed to have a fantastic network. We had set up an advisory board early and so had some very, very smart, knowledgeable people associated with the company. We, we definitely um, spent a lot of time talking to Google, talking to Yahoo, talking to the major players in the industry, talking to the ad agents, getting feedback on what's going on. And you know, what, I, I remember the moment when we said, oh shit, we're in trouble was when one of the ad agencies said, well, you know, Google's paying us to use Invite. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, yeah, it's, we, we call it Google Bucks. <laughs> and, well, okay, well, I can't compete with that. <laughs> we better find something else to do. I probably wouldn't have known that unless we made a point of going and talking to the agencies, going, well, well, what do we need to do to have you use us rather than use Invite, which was the, the company that Google bought. And they said, there's nothing you can do. They're paying us. So that, that's pretty important. The other thing, though, I think in, in our story that made this work was the architecture that the CTO designed. It, I'm, I'm not a technologist, but what I've learned from this process, um, Pat DeAngelis, who's our CTO, um, designed the architecture with flexibility in mind. He, you know, growing up at Moda Media as I did, um, was very mindful of the fact that things change, um, particularly in the, in, in the internet, and designed a component-based architecture with a set of, of principles that allowed him to say, look, if something changes, we can rip something out and replace it without upsetting the whole platform. It's not hard-coded. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm really not qualified to get into the, the, the depth of it, but he was very insistent on that early on and spent a lot of time on the architecture to make sure that it would be resilient and that it wouldn't break the first time that there was a change. And that's what allow, uh, has allowed us even to this day, the core architecture that he designed in 2008 hasn't changed any. Um, and so I think that, that's a really important aspect is plan for change in your technology architecture. But as, as you were, as you were making these decisions around, you know, taking this engine and, and the patents and, and applying them towards different fields, you know, who was, who was there? I mean, we talked about, you were at 50, some employees at the, yeah. at the time. Right. Th there must have been people in the room that, that, were, that were saying, yeah, this is the way to go, and you, you trusted them. There were many others that, that were in the room that are right. no longer there. Right. How, I mean, how did you figure out who you could sort of share what, what your thinking was, it must have been really challenging. It, it was really challenging, and you know, there's, I, this was my first CEO job, um, and so you know, I, could, I could do a whole thing about, you know, what do you learn in your fir the first time you actually sit in the chair, right? Because it's not the same when you're sitting in the second chair. I was the president at two other companies. It's different when, you, when, when you're in the chair. Um, you know, I, I had heard this cliche all the time that when you, our CEO brought into a company that you should clean house and get rid of the, the existing team and put your own people in place. I didn't do that at first, and it was a big mistake. <laughs> it was a big mistake. If I could do it over again, I would have fired the entire senior team my first week. Wow. Even your CEO? No, I brought him later. <laughs> <laughs> No, I did fire. There were there were co CTOs when I got there. I did fire them. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Nick. Did the thought come up to you? Did the thought come to your head that you should fire the people in the first week and you didn't listen to it, or did that come after the realization? No, it came afterwards. The realization because you know I'm I'm too nice a guy. I wouldn't do that. I, I've got to give people a chance. They have you know, and and everybody starts with a clean slate and. You know, will earn you know earn their their place in in my eyes, and you know I was very idealistic about that. Um, but what you realize very quickly in a situation like that is this is a company that had a lot of failure behind it, and these were the people who were part of that. <laughs> we were I didn't inherit nine million dollars in debt because this team was executing. <laughs> Yes. So let me ask you this question. 
With the IP change in the IP laws mm -hmm. and the speed with which you can get up to uh, scale using cloud computing, how do you view that? How important is it? I'm sure it was critical at one point. Is it as critical as it was in the past or I, I think it, it depends on what the business is, right? Um, Let's say it could be protected by IP, but the, the, I guess the question is you can get up so quickly, right? but IP takes a long time, it takes years, it's expensive. And it, it's expensive. It's it takes ex four years to get any kind of a patent. Right, I mean, you can file provisional very quickly, right. um, but you know, it's time, it's effort, and you don't know what's going to come of it or if it's going to turn into anything for years. Right. So much will change. Right. Does it make sense for the average technology startup to think about that as a critical core um, decision point? Well, I can tell you we haven't patented anything mm -hmm. since I've been at X plus one. And the patent that we have is violated across the entire industry. <laughs> wow. right. Everybody violates it blatantly. And there's not really anything we can do about it. Mm -hmm. We can't if, if we we, we're not funded to take on a prolonged legal battle against Yahoo, right. who's one of the violators. So what are you going to do? Right. I mean, some, some patents are, I, I've got like five myself, and yeah. defensively. No, yeah. Not so much that we thought we could protect the idea of the patent. Yeah. 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 To protect somebody else. Yeah. Right. So my, my question for you, it's interesting, because on the one hand you mentioned you have this core technology that was built very well very well thought out from the beginning, which allowed you to pivot around it. Fortunately, you are able to pivot businesses around it. But to do that almost implies not super fast. If you're going really fast, you might not be able to build an architecture like that. It's a very good, very good point. There, there's two ways to think about getting a software-based product to market. And I'm going to use a vernacular. And, and, it's not my thinking this, I'm, I'm channeling Pat. He said, you can build it from the glass backwards or you can build it from the back end forward. The right way to do it is to build it from the back end forward. But the way everybody in the internet gets to market quickly is they build it from the glass back. So you build a UI and you see it all the time. There's gerbils in the, in the background. There's people doing the work. There's not really, but the front end, what the user sees is, looks good and is slick. Pat insisted that we build it from the back end first. And what's really interesting is our competitors who built it from the front end backwards got way ahead of us in the marketplace, got a lot of market share, and to this day are still ahead of us from a market share standpoint. So let, let's, let's talk about your, your, your team a little bit. So, so you, you, you were at 50 something, yeah. you dropped down to 10 or so, or under 10? No, 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 well we never, never really dropped, dropped down. Okay, so you're, you we stayed were just swapping 50, people you swapping out. People. And, and as you were making those initial changes, what was the ratio of sort of business strategy to, to tech as in, those, in those early, that early, that first or second year? Wow, you know, it, it went like that. When I, out of the 50-something people, 20-something were in tech, and I think we fired 16 of them mm -hmm. right out of the gate. Um, so I came on in February. Um, we fired all the tech people because what, uh, what we had was a disaster. Um, Pat came on, so we closed the funding round May 28th, and Pat joined June 1st. Um, he was sitting on the sidelines and basically said, unless you have funding, you don't need a CTO. So as soon as you complete the funding, I'll join. <laughs> so Pat came on in June, and then we began to build the new tech team. Right. And, and, uh, and Pat was the guy who said the tech team should be built in Connecticut. That's right. So tell, take us through that a little bit. Well, um, so a, a whole bunch of the current team at X Plus One came out of a company that was based here in Connecticut called Moda Media. That's where I spent eight years um, of my career, um, and where Pat, um, Pat's brother actually was the CTO of Modem, that's how I knew, knew Pat. And when I approached Pat um, about uh, doing this, I, I wasn't gonna accept the CEO role unless I had a CTO that I trusted lined up, because I'm not a technologist, I couldn't. And you gotta trust your CTO. 
you, you just, you have to. Um, so when I approached Pat, he said, if you get the funding, I'd love to do it, but I'm not commuting into New York. John, I love you dearly, but if you want me, you have to have an office in Connecticut. <laughs> So we opened an office in South Norwalk, and it's turned out to be one of the best decisions that we ever made because we've been able to build a really strong tech team in Connecticut, um, and we don't have a lot of turnover in the team there. Um, where in New York, you have to compete with, with the big banks for tech talent. We're able to have people who don't want to do the commute into New York, and there's a lot of talent here in Connecticut, but that that desire to not have to get on the train every day um, ha has been a huge advantage in terms of getting great people and, and keeping them. You talked a lot about you know, changing up the guard on the team side. Yeah. How did you manage up in terms of your investors and your board of advisors and, and helping, you know, you can't fire them? Well, I did actually. <laughs> um, it's another one of those things that, um, you know, if I had it to do, I learned so much, if I had it to do over again, um, the uh, two of the board members I knew very well, and they were the ones who recruited me in. One, um, I, you know, I don't know how many of you guys are, are sort of internet veterans, but Rich Lafergie um, was the founder of the IAB, the Internet Advertising Bureau, and I was one of the founding board members, so Rich and I knew each other real well um, from the trade association, and he was the, um, the chairman at the time, and led the search committee, and then Mark Wright is an investor with Blue Chip, uh, venture company, and he was the founder of AtPlan, which was the first media planning tool for the web, and I was his first customer ever at Modem. Um, so I had really good relationships with two of the board members. <laughs> it's a nice way to start. Um, but there was one board member that I that I don't know whether he didn't like me, I don't know what, what set it off, but it was a challenge from the first day with this guy. Negative, combative, disruptive, um, and this went on for three years until I absolutely couldn't take it anymore and I went to the board and said, it's him or me. Either you guys get rid of him or I'm resigning. And they got rid of him. Uh, the next board meeting, one of his partners at, at the firm was there in his place and the tenor of the board changed like that from this negative, contentious board to a supportive, collaborative board, changing one person. The entire dynamic had circled around this guy. Yeah. And, and I would point to that as the turning point of us really taking off as a company. Um, it's now that your advisors are just critics. I, I, yeah, and we were able to get work done. We were actually able to make decisions as a board instead of fighting over, you know, what color, is that white or is it off-white? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So you give the picture of a company in 2008 that has, you know, was in debt, um, revenues are spiraling down, there's probably demoralized, maybe the technology is, you know, is not to leave. What in the world made you decide to this company? Um, Why would any same person do that? Well, that was, you know, it's a good question, Charles, because that was my first reaction. When, when Rich first called me and, and was telling me about the company, he's describing it, and I said, geez, Rich, that sounds a lot like Poindexter. And he says, John, it is Poindexter. They changed their name two years ago. <laughs> and I answered, why would I want to do that? That company's an effing mess. <laughs> and the answer was, because that's your opportunity. If you turn this, you know, nobody, I, yeah, I never. Did you know the technology well enough to understand that there was really an opportunity here to attend the tech last time? I mean, I mean, well, uh, so, so a, uh, okay, so I'll go in and fill in a part of the story. <laughs> um, at Modem Media in 1997, I came up with an idea that within the company became known as Project Toaster. And it was called Project Toaster by my partners at Modem because John wanted to build something that would do everything, including make your toast in the morning. And what, what that came to be was a client-side ad-serving technology. And I actually went to DoubleClick um, with the idea, um, and Kevin O'Connor, who was the founder of DoubleClick, when I pitched him on creating a client-side, because at this point, ad servers were controlled by the publishers. The publishers delivered the ads. The advertiser didn't deliver the ad. And I went to Kevin O'Connor and said, I got this crazy idea. I want to enable the advertiser to deliver the ads. 
That way the advertiser can count them. They know how many were really delivered. And they can collect the data about who clicked. And Kevin answered, why in God's name would I ever want to do that? <laughs> um, so I wound up uh, partnering with another ad serving company that failed miserably at the task and went out of business. And, but then we were on the hook for a bunch of client commitments for this idea. And our CTO at the time, a guy named Matt DeAngelis, was literally jumping up and down in, in the boardroom one day saying, my younger brother knows how to build this. I'm telling you, my brother can build this. His brother was Pat, who we hired, <laughs> who had been uh, building systems at a company called Blau Technologies for IBM and had been building a bunch of CRM technologies for IBM under contract. And sure enough, Pat knew exactly how to build this and built a company that we ultimately spun out of modem as a separate company called Centerport. Centerport, unfortunately, was a little ahead of its time because the budgets at the time were not enough to sustain the cost of the infrastructure. We didn't have cloud computing in, two in the year 2000 and 2001. So it was so expensive to buy the servers that we couldn't make the economics work. But I was chasing this idea since 1997. <laughs> so that was, the, that was really the hook. Rich basically said, you can make Centerport work here. So that's why I took the swing. Okay, Carrie, Casey? Can you share a little bit more information about uh, the raising that $9 million? You're new to the company. You've got a CTO standing on the sidelines. You're nine million you've got for whatever the debt. We had nine million in debt. Well, Google hadn't made their moves yet in the display advertising space in 2008. They didn't buy DoubleClick until 2000, late 2009. So that, that hadn't happened yet, because if that had happened, I probably wouldn't have been able to raise the money, because people would have said, well, how are you going to compete with Google? Um, the other thing I got lucky on is, I mean, this is 2008. I closed the deal May 28th, 2008. We know what happened about four months later, is the financial crisis hit, and we never would have gotten the money raised. So timing is everything. Um, you know, I, I, I think I was able to get the money because I, I had had a very successful run at Modem. I'd founded the trade organization. I, I'm credited, although slightly incorrectly, with placing the first paid ad ever on the internet. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I, had so, I had some credibility. That's pretty much all, which is why the board wanted me, because they would have been hard pressed to raise the money to save the company unless they had somebody who had some creds. So that's. What was the first video? Um, Zima on Hot, uh, Hot, um, Wired Magazine's website, which was called Hot Wired. It was on the beta. The insertion order was, I just went, I just did an interview the other day on this. The insertion order was signed September 15th, 1994, and the website went live October 17th. And then there, the other ad that we placed was the AT&T ad. Um, Sharon Otterman claims she got to it first, placing the first ad for IBM, but she's wrong. I have the insertion order. <laughs> <laughs> And Doug Weaver is the salesperson who was working for um, Wired at the, at the time, and he will say that Modem got there first. So um, right, right now, uh, John, in terms of your, your overall employees, it's, it's like 120 or, or so? Yep. And, and what percent of them are in New York? You're in Chicago and also in Connecticut? Or? Yeah, um, there, there's a handful of people in Chicago uh -huh. and salespeople scattered in other places. Basically 70 people in New York, 40 people in Connecticut, and then 10 sort of scattered yeah. around. And, and, and the, the, the tech skills, I mean, you mentioned some interesting companies that we've heard of, certainly Modem. Yeah. Blau was certainly a company that, yeah. that, that many people uh, have heard of. They, they were a real powerhouse as a marketing agency pre-Modem. Yeah, at, right. sure. Um, I, I'm sure the people that are working for you in, in Norwalk came from a whole bunch of interesting companies. Yeah. Have you brought jobs in, or have they been Connecticut people who were just found and we're happy to find a, a nice home. Well, we brought some people in as well. Um, so you know, the, 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 the wonderful thing about being a CEO is that you get to choose the people you work with. <laughs> I, it took me a while to learn that because I, I sort of inherited those people that, that weren't mine. Um, I'm way happier these days because I've reassembled a bunch of my old friends from Modem 
And then the last company I was at previous uh, to, to uh, X plus one, I was the president of a company called MMA, Marketing Management Analytics in Wilton, Connecticut. Um, and Wilton, uh, I'm sorry, MMA um, is the company that invented marketing mix modeling. So heavy econometric modeling, statistical modeling, quant shop. Um, so I was able to bring a bunch of those folks with me and infuse the tech guys with the heavy duty quant side. Um, and of course they all lived in Connecticut too. <laughs> Right. So, um, so, so your so your uh, so your tech shop actually has the quant guys there as well. Has quant guys as well. Yeah. Interesting. So you really it's, it's, so it's not just people coding what the guys in New York say. There's new models that are being developed, pr maybe presented to the people in New York, and then and then we've got some quant guys. Our, our chief analytics officer is actually in New York, um, but there's a good amount of quant talent um, in the actual engineering group and the head of database. Um, was at Centerport and then followed me to uh, MMA and now to X plus one. So he's done the whole circuit um, and, and has seen a lot of this stuff. Um, I, I actually, I talk a lot about there being tribes within the company because there's another tribe um, that we're really lucky to, to be associated with. Does anybody remember a company called Unicast? Yeah. Right, Unicast essentially invented the first rich media, the first interstitial, the first animated ads. And the CTO founder of that company was a fellow named Rick Landsman, who I would argue today probably invented more of what we believe, what we see of advertising on the internet than anybody else. And he's authored 18 patents, so he's, you know. Well, you remember, you had a couple of guys from Prodigy, too. Oh, yeah. Bob Bosser, Tom Gillespie, you had people there who had been online before the internet was a thing. Well, the modem guy started in, 19, in 1988, so. You know, there, that was, there was no internet. When I joined Modem, I didn't know anything about the internet. I thought I was going to be doing work on Prodigy and America Online. <laughs> the internet was really not on the radar screen yet. I, I want to tell a story about that with Modem. I remember meeting, I don't know which of the founders, there were three people at the time, and I yeah. went to lunch with two of them. And I remember saying, they used to take, uh, they used to write a column in Promo Magazine That's right. about the internet. And I remember, like, nobody knew what the internet was. <laughs> And I said to him, I said, what is this thing, the internet, that you write about? He says, well, you know, it's something that's coming. There's a lot of technology and buzz around it. And I said, so what do you do on the internet? He goes, nothing. <laughs> what do you mean you do nothing? He says, well, you know, everybody likes to talk about it, but we do phone promo, phone promotions. That's right. He says, everybody calls up and wants to do the internet, but they end up doing some sort of phone card or phone, phone promotion sweepstakes. And that was it. But when the world changed, they were the only game. That's so right. That was so smart. They were they were ready, and and uh, you know I, I could tell you guys stories on that, but one that, that's that's worth sharing because the NCAA tournament is, is on is um, I, I joined Modem in the fall of '94. Um, in early '95, we won the CBS account, and I was in charge of building the first website for CBS, which we did. And of course, we pitched them this great idea: why don't we put up a bracket for the NCAA tournament on your website? 1995, that's a, that was innovative. Nobody had ever done an online contest before. Um, so we, we hired somebody, because we didn't know how to write the code for that. We hired somebody to write the code, and we hosted it on a Spark 10 box, which was a big box at the time. And we got this, uh, the bracket up and running on the CBS site, and we were all excited. And um, the next thing we know, we we're watching the, the start of the tournament, and the announcer says, and to fill out your bracket to join the CBS NCAA tournament, go to www.cbs.com and fill out your bracket. And we all went, <gasps> yeah, uh-oh. <laughs> well, that's, that Spark 10 box was a pile of slag in about three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> And, and of course, uh, uh, God, I'm trying to remember George's last name was the general manager of, of marketing for, for CBS, of course. Schweitzer, George Schweitzer, that's right, was, got on the phone and was screaming at us because nobody can get into the contest. The site's down. And I, I said, but George, you didn't tell us you were going to announce it on television. And he said, we're CBS. What the hell did you think we were going to do? <laughs> That's a, you, 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 you mentioned contextual, which is different. 
No, no, we do behavioral as well. I mean, you know, behavioral is a big, there's, there's a, a really wide space that that covers, right? From the privacy stomping scary stuff to the really basic and benign stuff. So, you know, if you go to a commerce website and put something in your shopping cart and don't buy it, you're gonna see ads for that product following you around for the next three weeks. That's called retargeting. That doesn't, nobody's, that doesn't weird anybody out. Everybody kind of understands that you went to the website, you looked at the item, they're gonna ad, advertise that product to you. Um, so we do that. Um, what we don't do that freaks people out is we don't collect your browsing behavior across multiple sites, right? And then interpolate from that behavior things about you. Now, we buy data from people who do that, but we don't do it. <laughs> um, so that, that's really the thing that really freaks people out um, because essentially you're spying on them, right? So um, we will um, track your behavior within the client's website. So if you go to uh, chase.com and you go to the mortgage page, we're gonna log that and we're gonna know that you're interested or in market for a mortgage and we'll use that to market to you. But if you go to uh, some other mortgage site out on the internet, we're not tracking you there. That, that's, that sort of crosses the line. But you've got the bunny trail that I went to lending trade, right? You know where I left to? Uh, potentially. Right. Yeah. So um, when you're when you're dealing with a client in the first party domain, so you know, picking on we, we work with a bunch of banks, uh, you log in to your online I say, bank. Did you share? So when when we are actually transacting in the client's first party domain, it's not a third party cookie, okay. and they pass us the ID. So even if you erase your cookie, the next time you go to your banking site, it's gonna get re reassembled. Left over from the video, but it seems to fit in this line of question. If the, sh is Sheridan, was that the name? Yeah, Andy Sheridan. Andy Sheridan. <laughs> if he had decided to go to Disney World, yeah. the first time he saw the ad, would you still serve up Disney ads for the next three weeks? Even though he's made the purchase? Uh, if he made the purchase online, absolutely not. We would know that that purchase would be logged, he'd be taken out of the, out of the list. That's good. I wanted to, oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, sure. Why not? <laughs> no, I just wanted to back, you know, back to the pivoting. Yeah. Um, in the case of your company, you had to pivot. I mean, you lost 60% of your business overnight. It was pretty obvious to you that you, were gonna, you had to pivot or die. I think in a lot of cases it's more, a little more subtle. How do you know, you know, when it's not that dramatic, A, should you pivot and how, you know, is it a 90 degree pivot? Is it a 45 degree pivot? You know, <laughs> any comment around that, or, you know, when it's a little more subtle? Well, I, boy, that's, that's a hard thing to answer. Um, you know, because that's about analyzing the environment, analyzing your own talent. Like, what pivot are you capable of making, right? What, what, uh, what financing do you have? Uh, you know, I, I always sort of think of my, my responsibility to, to the company as a CEO of first saying, you know, do we have the right strategy? Do we have the financing to support that strategy? And then do I have the people to support the strategy, right? But you, you do have, the strategy has to be informed at the same time by the, fi by the money you have and the people that you have to execute. You can't separate those. So it's, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to do a small pivot than a, than a big pivot. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Isn't, isn't that where a customer advisory board plays such an essential role? You were having dialogues whether or not you had a formal advisory board. Yeah, I mean, you, you, have, you have to get advice from people for sure. Um, and talk to people and you get insights and you know I'm wrestling right now with um, a potential acquisition in the in the Facebook space and we had a really clear strategy and we were executing and then I met a fellow who said something that was so smart and so insightful and so contrarian to our strategy I went didn't think of that and now we're having to reassess well geez, does that position hold water or not because if that guy's right, 
then we're really wrong. <laughs> and we're going to spend a lot of money on something that's really wrong. And so we're, we're now going through that process of trying to validate, you know, does this guy have a point? Is he right? Well, that's interesting. That's a, I, I want to hear you talk about product a little bit. And when I do this contact, you came in and the CTO came in and said, hey, you know, story. Yeah. Who controls production? Yeah. Controls the world. Yes. The CTO controls production. So you know, so he Yeah. But do you think going back, you had said that it was the technology group was in us, et cetera, et cetera. Was it really a failure of a tech group or was it a lack of strong product management? It was both. It was both. Um, the the dysfunctional board I inherited had been in place. There was a reason why they had churned through five CEOs before I got there. And you know, again, this is the things you only learn after being through it. Um, there was a reason the company was in the, the, the board was really the problem. Because the, the, no matter what the management team wanted to do, it was a battle with the board. They were never right. <laughs> um, so they had trouble retaining people. Um, they, they started out with five founders. Three of the original founders left early on because they no longer believed that the board was supportive of what they were trying to do. It was a very, it was, it was a very um, not very constructive environment. Um, in fact, um, of the founders, only one of the founders is still with the company. And the, the other fellow who um, was really the brains behind the original concept has gone on to be enormously successful. And his new company has far outgrown X plus one. It's a company called MediaMath. Oh, wow. Uh, Interesting.